Okay, it's good to see the most enthusiastic linguists here today. So this is really great. And the Austronesianers camp, well represented. Um, one of the great pleasures um, of being a, a supervisor is when you have an opportunity to, to introduce one of your former students in a new role. Uh, welcome back to SOAS as um, postdoctoral researcher at Oxford. Many of you know Charlotte graduated last year. Um, I won't spend too much time introducing her, but she's one of our spectacular products. Um, rave reviews on her dissertation. Um, the Robins Prize for the Philo <coughs> by the Philological Society for an essay that was published in the proceedings, Phil's like proceedings, um, conference presentations, international superstar, in the making. <laughs> That's quite an introduction. I hope I can live yeah, up to it. it. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to hear about um, some of the work she's been doing on languages in uh, Malaysia. And uh, over to you, Charlotte. Okay, thank you. So firstly, um, as the room is very big and my voice is very uh, quiet, if at any point I'm too, too low, please let me know and I'll try and talk much louder. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about aspects of syntactic variation in Western Austronesian languages um, and why these, these aspects of variation might prompt us to move beyond um, classifying Austronesian languages in this part of the world as either Philippine type or Indonesian type. The aim of the talk is to demonstrate that a two-way typology is insufficient for two reasons. Firstly, because there are aspects of variation within the categories of Philippine type and Indonesian type. And secondly, because we find a series of languages um, that cannot be neatly classified as either one of the two classes. Um, and I'm going to do this by looking at two phenomena that are known to differ between Philippine type and Indonesian type languages, namely voice alternations um, and word order. So given this range of variation, I'm going to argue that a more fruitful approach um, is to look at more fine-grained parameters of variation in order to be able to address theoretical debates and also proposed historical changes that have uh, been proposed to take place in Western Austronesia. Um, okay, so to start with, uh, let's define a few key terms. Um, so when we talk about Western Austronesian, we're not talking about a genetic subgroup of any sort. Rather, we're talking about a kind of geographical grouping of languages spoken in this part of Asia um, and Madagascar that share a typological characteristic, which is relatively rare cross-linguistically, namely symmetrical voice alternations. The best way, I think, to understand what a symmetrical voice alternation is, is to compare with asymmetrical alternations. Unfortunately, they don't all fit on the screen, but you can see them in your handout anyway. Um, so voice alternations, as we know, represent um, different mappings between semantic arguments and syntactic functions, um, or various different ways that we can express notionally transitive events, um, perhaps given different semantic interpretations or perhaps to uh, fulfill different discourse functions. So in English, we have two ways of expressing uh, transitive events. We have an active construction and a passive construction. In the active construction, it's the actor semantic role that's mapped to subject. And in the passive construction, it's the undergoer. We all know this. This is fairly basic. Um, in addition to this kind of alternation in which semantic role is mapped to syntactic function, there are also morphological and syntactic asymmetries. Um, so the active um, is syntactically transitive. It has two core arguments, um, I and Alwi, that are both expressed as core nominal arguments. Um, and the verb is morphologically unmarked for voice. In contrast, if we look at the passive construction, um, then we see that um, it's intransitive. It has only one core argument, and the actor now is expressed either as a prepositional biphrase or uh, omitted altogether. Um, and also, we've got morphological marking. So we have the passive auxiliary was. So here you can see uh, we go from transitive to intransitive and morphologically unmarked to morphologically marked. So we could think of these as being morphosyntactically asymmetrical. If we look in contrast at uh, our Western Austronesian languages like Madhuri's um, and Tagalog, we see again that we have uh, alternative ways of mapping semantic roles to syntactic functions, the actor voice, undergo a voice, and so on constructions. 
Um, but unlike our active-passive alternations, these are morphosyntactically symmetrical. So take Majorese, for example, uh, which is in two. Um, <clears throat> we have the actor voice in which uh, the actor is mapped to subject, and we have the undergoer voice in which the undergoer is mapped to subject. But both of these constructions take morphological marking on the verb. The root pokol takes a nasal assimilation form in the actor voice, um, and it takes this e prefix in the undergoer voice construction. So both of these are equally morphologically marked. Um, and both of these look like transitive constructions. So both of them have two nominal arguments which are expressed as noun phrases uh, rather than prepositional phrases, which would be how um, obliques are typically expressed in Majoris and other languages in Indonesia. Um, so we could think of this as being morphologically and syntactically symmetrical. Um, and the same applies for Tagalog. Again, we can see that there are various different ways of expressing kind of the same notionally transitive event of buying. Um, in each case, the verb is morphologically marked in a certain way. Uh, so the root billy can become bumili, binili, binilihan, and so on and so forth. Um, and in each case, we seem to have um, a syntactically transitive construction that involves at least two arguments marked with core argument cases, ang and nang. Um, so both of these alternations appear to be syntactically symmetrical, and this is kind of our key defining characteristic of Western Austronesian languages. Um, however, as you will notice, there are several important differences, or really noticeable differences, between um, Majorese and Tagalog, although they both seem to be morphosyntactically symmetrical in the way that I just defined for you. Um, first and foremost, as you can see probably more clearly on the handout than the screen, um, there are a much greater number of voice alternations in Tagalog. So in addition to the actor and the undergoer voice, uh, we also see a locative voice construction in 3C, an instrumental voice in 3D, and a benefactor voice in the second 3B, which should be 3E. Um, and there are other differences. So Majorese is SVO word order, whereas Tagalog has verb initial order. Um, and in Majorese, the subject is marked by its initial position, whereas in Tagalog, the subject is marked by nominal case marking. So these and other differences have led people to talk about the alternations in two um, as being Indonesian type and the alternations in three as being Philippine type. And this is our two-way system of classification. Okay, so what do these terms mean? Although the terms are highly prevalent in the literature, um, often they are not very clearly defined. So people tend to use these terms without really saying what they mean by them. As such, it's quite difficult to know if you had language X, would you classify that as being Philippine type um, or Indonesian type? So most uh, models that try and make this definition a little bit more explicit tend to focus in on structural properties that seem to cluster around the languages in the Philippines like Tagalog um, and cluster around the languages in Indonesia like Majorese. Um, so one such definition is given on the handout in page three. Um, and it picks up a series of structural properties, and I've sort of summarized these and some others in table one. So Indonesian type languages have symmetrical alternations, uh, just like Philippine type languages, um, but they differ in the sense that in addition to this, they seem to have a passive construction that looks very similar to English. Uh, they also have applicative suffixes. Uh, if you wanted to make an instrument or a benefactive or a locative into the subject in Indonesian, you would have to use an applicative construction combined with the undergoer voice morphology. Um, and, oh, I think, sorry, I think, I think this should be the other way around. So this should be a no and this should be a yes. Um, so they don't have micro roles like instrument, etc., with their own voices. In contrast, Philippine languages do. They also have, in addition to voice morphology, mood marking morphology, uh, and they have the case marking that we saw in Tagalog. And I've added to this list also the differences in word order that we saw. So kind of roughly speaking, when people talk about Indonesian type and Philippine type, this kind of seems to be what they're talking about, series of different structural properties. Um, and so these two labels are a nice starting point to reflect important differences in the languages. Um, but the question that I want to ask for the rest of the, the talk is does this two-way typology, or does this kind of little table here really, reflect the full extent of variation that we find in this Western Austronesian language um, area? And 
as I've said already, I'm going to argue no, and I'm going to argue no on the basis of um, variation that we find in voice systems and in word order. OK. Um, so I think that um, if this kind of model was the correct one, then it kind of makes the prediction that if we have a language with a multi-voice system, then it should have the kind of properties that are associated with Philippine-type languages. And vice versa, if we have a language that has a two-voice system, then maybe we expect to find the sort of Indonesian-type properties. If it's a good model, then that's the kind of the predictions that we might make from it. Um, however, what I'd like to show you is that this doesn't really hold up. In fact, there's a lot of variation uh, in the types. The number of voice alternations that we find in the different systems and also in the sorts of properties that are associated with them. Um, so although... Um, those multi-voice systems of the type that we saw in Tagalog are prevalent in Formosan and Philippine-type languages and have, in fact, been reconstructed for Proto-Austronesian. If we turn to page four in the handout, um, we'll see that actually there are a large number of languages um, in the Philippines and in Taiwan um, that have actually a reduced voice system with only three alternations. Um, so you see examples in four and five. Uh, from Kavalan, which is a language spoken in Taiwan, um, and Kadazandusun, which is a language spoken in northern Borneo. Um, but you can see that there's no real pattern to which voice is reduced in these three voice systems. So Kavalan has, in addition to actor and undergoer voice, also an instrument voice, um, Kada whilst Kadazandusun has, in addition to actor and undergoer, a benefactor voice. And Blus kind of says that in fact, from all the languages that he's looked at, there really isn't any dominant pattern in terms of which voices are lost. So this might be kind of some aspect of variation that we might want to account for in some way. What's sort of, I think, more problematic for this model is that there are a series of languages, particularly in Borneo and Sulawesi, um, that have either multi-voice or two-voice systems without necessarily having these properties split in this way. Um, so, for example, if you look on page five, um, you'll see the languages Lundaya uh, from Borneo and Tondano from Sulawesi. Both of these languages have more than two voice alternations, so they have a multi-voice system, but as you can see, they differ from the Tagalog examples um, in interesting ways. Um, so they don't have case marking, and in the case of Tondano, the word order is SVO. Um, so we have multi-voice systems that don't necessarily have these properties that we've said are typically Philippine type. Um, on the other hand, we also have languages like uh, Saban, which is also from northern uh, central Borneo, um, that has a two-voice system and kind of looks, if you look at the example in eight, very similar to the Madurese alternation. Um, but unlike other Indonesian-type languages, it uh, doesn't have applicative suffixes and doesn't seem to have a true passive construction. And kind of last but not least, we find some languages like uh, Tukang Basi, which seems to have a mixture of both. So it kind of has a multi-voice system and it has case marking in its verb initial, uh, but it also has applicative suffixes. So really, I think that there's kind of a greater range of variation than we might expect if this really were the kind of model that we wanted to go for. Um, and so our two-way distinction doesn't really allow us to make any kind of particularly interesting typological predictions. Uh, so what's the alternative then? So I'm going to propose that a more interesting way of looking at voice alternations in Western Austronesian um, is to compare the different voices in terms of their morphological, syntactic, semantic and discourse properties. Um, and I argue that this will allow us to address important, an important theoretical debate, namely the nature of alignment in Western Austronesian languages. Um, and also a proposed historical change, namely an alignment shift from ergative in the Philippine-type languages to accusative in the Indonesian-type languages. So just a kind of brief reminder then of what we mean by alignment. If you look at the bottom of page six, um, you'll see that typically when we talk about accusative alignment, um, what we mean is that the actor of a transitive clause is treated in the same way as the single argument of an intransitive clause. Uh, by contrast, ergative alignment um, is normally understood as the undergoer of a transitive clause being treated in the same way as the single argument um, of an intransitive clause. So what the reason why uh, symmetrical voice languages have been so tricky for this kind of 
understanding of alignment is that, as we saw already when we looked at Madjeriz and Tagalog, we have languages that seem to have multiple different types of transitive clause that all look kind of, at least morphosyntactically, equally basic. Um, so the question becomes, um, do we compare this intransitive clauses with the active voice construction, in which case we might say the alignment is accusative, or do we compare the, uh, sing the trans intransitive clauses with the undergoer voice construction, in which case we'd probably say uh, that the alignment is ergative. And I'm going to follow um, Krager in saying that the way we can decide which way to go and therefore what the alignment would be is to try and work out whether AV and UV uh, which one of them is more basic, basically. Um, and there are various ways that we can kind of understand a voice or a transitive clause to be basic. We can look at morphosyntactic clues, like syntactic transitivity and morphological markedness. Um, but as we saw with Majorese and Tagalog already, in the case of symmetrical voice alternations, these don't necessarily tell us very much. Um, so in these kind of contexts, it falls to look at the levels of semantics and the levels of discourse and ask ourselves, is one or other of these voices more semantically, prototypically transitive? Um, and is one or other of these voice constructions more prototypically transitive on a discourse level? Hopefully what we mean by this will become clear as we go through some examples. Okay, so if we adopt this sort of approach, then I argue that we can see some asymmetries between the voices, at least in terms of semantic and discourse properties, uh, which would support the idea of a shift from ergative to accusative, um, in, from Philippine to Indonesian type languages. And we can also identify a series of languages, um, particularly in parts of Borneo, um, that represent possible intermediate stages in this transition and therefore reinforce why it's so important not to just think of languages in Western Austronesian as belonging to one of two structural classes, but to look in kind of more detail at the types of variation that we find. Um, okay, so I said already that Western Austronesian languages have been kind of defined as being morphosyntactically symmetrical, uh, which would suggest that morpho morphology and syntax kind of wouldn't give us any evidence at all as to whether languages are basic, but it's not quite as simple as that. In fact, we do find certain morphosyntactic asymmetries. Um, I won't have much to say about that here, um, but I thought it was interesting anyway to note that there are some languages where we do see um, one or other of these voices being unmarked as opposed to the other one. So for example, in um, Pangatura and Sama, uh, the undergoer voice construction is unmarked, as you can see in 10a, whereas the active voice construction is marked. So this is starting to look a little bit more like a prototypical ergative antipassive alternation in terms of the morphology. Um, and we also sometimes find syntactic asymmetries. Um, so in Kapampangan, which is another Philippine type language, um, <coughs> if you look at the cross-referencing system in 11, uh, you'll see that if you look at the actor voice in 11a, then only the actor is cross-referenced in that uh, particle yang. Whereas if you look at the undergo voice construction in 11b, then you'll see that actually that the particle n cross-references both the actor and the undergoer. So this might suggest in some way that the UV construction is more transitive in that the cross-referencing particle has to make reference to both of these two arguments. Um, and that would then support UV as being the basic clause and hence alignment as ergative. Um, so that's Philippine type. And if we look at Indonesian type languages, we find kind of some syntactic evidence that might support um, the identification of AV in contrast as being more basic. Um, so one example would be secondary predicates in Balinese, uh, which can modify both the actor and undergoer in an AV construction, um, as shown in 12a, um, but only modify the undergoer in a UV construction, as um, in 12b. So um, th this might suggest then that AV is somehow more syntactically transitive um, than UV and that the alignment is accusative. Uh, Riesberg looks at Balinese in quite a lot of detail and concludes that if we look at other kind of syntactic tests apart from secondary predicates, overall we would probably want to conclude that um, Balinese is really syntactically symmetrical and that um, the actor in a UV construction really is a core argument. 
Um, but it kind of just goes to show that maybe these morphosyntactic symmetries are a matter of degree rather than a kind of symmetrical or asymmetrical binary contrast. Okay, so the more interesting levels for us, I think, in terms of comparison of symmetrical voice uh, languages are semantics and discourse. Okay, so when we talk about semantic transitivity, um, what I kind of, the sort of model that I'm adopting is the one um, suggested by Hopper and Thompson, um, and they suggest that transitivity is not just a syntactic notion, but rather can be associated with particular semantic interpretations and particular semantic properties, some of which will be associated with prototypically transitive events and some of which will be associated with kind of lower transitivity or less prototypical events. Um, and they have a list of different parameters which they class as being high and low. And I've kind of summarized these in table two according to the different semantic properties that are most commonly associated with active clauses uh, passive clauses and anti-passive clauses. So active clauses, uh, in semantic terms, generally have two distinct participants. They'll have an actor that could be seen as being highly agentive and volitional, kind of willingly initiates the action. Um, they have an undergoer that's usually completely affected um, by the action of this event, um, and the event is usually or usually entails punctual and telic action. So these kind of semantic properties are generally associated with active clauses in semantic terms. Um, in contrast, antipassives will generally have a non-specific um, or unaffected undergoer um, and are often associated with ongoing or non-punctual action. And finally, passives are also kind of lower in transitivity uh, on a semantic level and are associated with non-specific or perhaps non-agentive actors um, and stative or resultative interpretations. Um, so if we kind of use these, um, let me put them on the screen for you. If we kind of use these definitions of kind of basicness in terms of uh, semantic properties, then we'll see that in Philippine type languages, generally UV, looks semantically like an active transitive clause, whereas the AV construction looks a lot more like an anti-passive. And if we sort of fast forward to Indonesian type languages, we kind of find that actually AV looks like an active transitive clause. Um, and maybe in some languages, UV is starting to look a lot more like a passive in semantic terms. Um, and what's kind of interesting is that we also find a series of languages that are somewhere in the middle. So maybe sometimes AV has anti-passive semantics and sometimes it has active semantics. So this again could be kind of a, a midpoint in our transition, if you like. Um, so some of the evidence for this um, is in the handout. Um, <coughs> for example, if we look at Sabuanu, we'll see that in 13, on, we're on page nine now, um, the undergoer voice is associated with punctual action, which remember we said was a high transitivity parameter, whereas the actor voice is associated with non-punctual interpretations. Um, and moreover, as you may well know, it's very common in Austronesian lang in, uh, Philippine languages for the AV to um, be used only when the uh, undergoer is non-specific, indefinite or non-presuppositional. Um, and again, you can see some examples from Tagalog that show it's actually ungrammatical for us to find a definite undergoer in an AV construction. And it's also at least strange, if not completely ungrammatical, for us to use an active voice construction in a, in a context where the undergoer would be inherently affected. So if we wanted to say something like Juan killed a dog, we would have to use the undergoer voice construction. I don't know why we would want to say that, but if we did, um, <laughs> then we would have to use the undergoer voice construction rather than the actor voice, um, because that would, be, that would be semantically odd. So these kind of tend to suggest um, maybe that UV is basic in semantic terms and AV is less prototypically transitive. Um, in Indonesian type languages, in contrast, we don't find this kind of restriction against definite undergoers in the AV clauses. In fact, if we looked at Balinese in 16, we would see um, that we can get actor voice constructions uh, when we have an event that inherently affects the undergoer, like kicking the dog. I feel like the dog is treated very badly in all of these linguistics examples. 
Um, but also you can see um, the dog can be modified by a definite suffix. So here it's clearly possible to get a definite undergoer in the AB construction. And therefore AB starts to look a lot more like an active type clause with these sorts of active semantics. Um, and there have been corpus studies to suggest that in some Indonesian type languages, uh, as I said, the UV construction starts to look a lot more like a passive in that it tends to be used with non-specific actors or perhaps with a no actor altogether. Um, and sometimes even has kind of stative interpretations. So at least in some languages, we start to see the kind of opposite pattern where we look like we have accusative alignment. Uh, what's worth noting is that actually in Indonesian type languages, more so than in Philippine type languages, there's quite a lot of variation. So there are some Indonesian type languages, or at least languages with those sets of properties that we discussed, um, where the active voice construction is still associated with some anti-passive like uh, properties such as ongoing or non-punctual action. Um, and there are other languages where the UV construction is also still associated with some more active characteristics like dynamic action and so on. So it depends a little bit um, on which language you're looking for. And actually, all, whilst this variation is kind of messy for our previous model and we wanted to call them all Indonesian type, uh, it's not such a problem if we think of these languages as somehow being on a um, on a scale or representing lots of different points in a transition from kind of more prototypically ergative to more prototypically accusative. So I think in actual fact it's quite nice that we find this variation because it seems to support the idea um, that these languages could be undergoing some sort of alignment shift at least at the level of semantics. And we see this even more clearly if we look at languages in Borneo, uh, like Moronene, where the active voice... So the, in Moronene, the uh, undergoer voice construction always appears like an active transitive clause. It always has these high semantic uh, properties. Um, but the active voice construction can sometimes appear like an anti-passive um, and sometimes appear like the active. OK. So this might suggest that we want to look at languages in sort of terms of some sort of shift, like I said, really, um, where we start with languages that kind of look ergative in semantic terms, where the UV is associated with high transitivity and the AV is always associated with low transitivity. Um, and then we move through stages where we get different degrees of symmetricality towards a kind of stage at the end where we have an accusative alignment system um, with uh, UV being associated now with low transitivity like a passive um, and AV being associated with high transitivity like an active. Um, okay, so if we look then at differences in the discourse levels, we'll find kind of more or less the same sorts of patterns. Um, and now we're thinking um, about discourse in terms of um, Givon's discourse topicality. Um, and he says that in a typical active clause in discourse terms, we're going to have an actor that's highly topical um, and an undergoer that's also quite topical but less topical than the actor. This is kind of what we would expect from our basic transitive clause. Um, and if instead we're dealing with something that's functionally a bit more like a passive or an anti-passive, then we might expect only one of these arguments to be really high in topicality. So in a passive, we would expect the undergoer to be the most topical and the actor to be kind of not very topical. And in an anti-passive, it's the other way around. So we would expect um, the actor to be topical and the undergoer to be less so. Um, and if we kind of take that as our basic understanding of, of discourse properties of voice alternations, then again we see the same sort of patterns whereby Philippine type, in Philippine type languages it's UV that seems to have this sort of um, uh, discourse structure and AV looks a bit like an anti-passive, whereas in Indonesian type languages um, AV is the one that looks like the active clause um, and UV starts to look a bit more like a passive. Um, and then we find some languages that could represent possible intermediate stages um, like Calabit, where both AV and UV seem to have or seem to be able to convey um, events in which both actor and undergoer are topical. And you can see this if you look in Table 4, um, <coughs> which is a study that looks at the topicality of the different arguments and quantifies this using various metrics proposed by Givon. 
um, and then they're scaled and averaged and presented in the table. So we can talk about how this is done in more detail if you want later on. Um, but the important kind of point to take from this, I think, is that if you look in Cebuano, the UV construction looks kind of more prototypical or more basic um, than the AV construction. The actor is highly topical and the undergoer less so, whereas in the AV construction, the actor is kind of still more topical than the undergoer, but less so overall. In Indonesian, we kind of get something that looks a little bit different. Um, so in AV, the actor is topical and the undergoer is less so, but that kind of looks a bit more like an active clause. Um, and UV is starting to look a bit like a passive in, in these terms at least, um, because the undergoer is more topical than the actor. And then what's sort of interesting is if you look at Calabit in the middle of those two lines, both AV and UV seem to have the discourse properties that we expect from an active ergative clause. Um, so again, we seem to have something where we've got something that looks kind of discourse ergative, something that kind of looks discourse symmetrical, and something that looks kind of discourse um, accusative. And I think it's sort of worth pointing out that actually if we look just in terms of these the structural properties that Calabit has, we might be tempted to class Calabit as being Philippine type, like um, uh, Tagalog and many of the other languages that we saw, but that would then miss some of these kind of important differences between Calabit and Cebuano that we see when we analyze kind of semantic and discourse differences as well. So that was an awful lot of data and uh, models and so on, but um, the point that I really hope was clear from all of this is that distinguishing between the two typological groups, Philippine type and Indonesian type, doesn't really capture um, the surface level morphosyntactic variation and definitely doesn't really capture the more fundamental differences in alignment that we see if we kind of compare the different voice constructions on all of these levels. So a better approach is to do just that and to look at how differences in morphology, syntax, semantics and discourse um, might have implications for how prototypically transitive the different voices are. Um, this approach lends support to the idea that Western Austronesian languages have undergone a shift in alignment from ergative to accusative and provides some evidence of possible intermediate stages. Um, and it also suggests that we might want to consider alignment in general as being kind of more of a scale from prototypically ergative, where we might expect morphology, syntax, semantics and discourse all to point to one of the constructions as being basic, uh, to prototypically accusative, where ditto, we might expect all of these levels to support AV as being basic via a series of kind of possible intermediate stages where the different levels of structure will, re will reveal different levels of, of symmetry. Okay, so now if I still have time and I haven't put everyone to sleep, um, then I wanted to show you that if we look at word order, we kind of are forced to come to the same conclusion really that Philippine type and Indonesian type or a two-way system isn't really sufficient to capture the kind of variation that we find. Um, and um, I'll show this by, by showing that there's important variation among both verb initial and SVO languages in terms of how flexible the word order is um, and that there are also seemingly languages where the basic word order differs depending on uh, which voice construction we're looking at. Okay, um, so firstly, although it is kind of true that most Philippine type languages are verb initial, um, just calling them verb initial or kind of calling them all Philippine type misses quite an important distinction between languages that are rigidly VOS and languages that allow a flexible uh, VOS, S, so, sorry, VOS, VSO order uh, like Tagalog. So an example of a fixed word order language would be CDIC in 19 and uh, Tagalog is a flexible language um, in 20. So why this is kind of a non-trivial distinction is because it seems to correlate with certain other word order patterns, um, as discussed by Aldridge, um, namely the position in which um, adjuncts can be questioned. So where we have fixed VOS word order languages like CDIC and also Malagasy, I believe, uh, we can only uh, question adjuncts in situ, so they are always questioned following the verb. However, in Tagalog and other alternating languages, it seems that it's possible to question adjuncts um, initially, so they can be somehow extracted or appear in the initial position or however we want to kind of analyse this 
theoretically. So this has led to kind of different possible theoretical accounts, at least in Aldridge's work, um, and there's therefore, I think we can assume that there's potentially not a non-trivial um, distinction between them. So there's more variation in verb initial languages than is accounted for if we just call them all verb initial, is, is basically the point that I'm making. Um, we also get variation in Indonesian type languages. Um, we get variation in terms of how flexible languages are, so some are really fixed and some allow almost all possible combinations of subject, verb and object, depending on things like information structure. Um, and we find that in Indonesian type languages, sometimes the word order choice is affected by the voice construction. Um, so for example, in language, although Majorese has SVO, regardless of which voice construction we're looking at, um, in a language like Indonesian, um, as you can see in 23, if you have um, an undergo a voice construction, which involves um, a first or second person agent, then you tend to have a different construction in which you get the order subject, um, so that would be undergo a actor verb or subject object verb, um, as shown in 20. Um, and sometimes you find that the, the possible orders vary depending on the, the voice construction. So in Balinese, for example, you can get SVO and uh, verb initial orders, but you can only find VSO order um, in the actor voice. I don't really have a very good explanation for why you find these things. I just thought it was worth noticing that um, SVO actually incorporates, calling these all languages all SVO incorporates a kind of range of different possibilities that we find. Um, what I think is quite interesting um, is that we find a series of languages, particularly in Borneo, like West Coast, Bajau, and also Calabit, um, where the um, basic word order seems to differ according to um, the voice construction. So in all of these languages, it seems to be the case that in AV, our active voice construction, the basic word order is SVO, whereas in UV, um, the basic word order is um, verb initial. It could be that this is, would differ if we looked at different genres. Um, it tends to be that most study lo studies look at narratives, um, but that kind of seems to be the pattern that's being reported in the literature, and certainly was the pattern that I also found when I looked at it in Calabit narratives, as summarised in Table 5. Um, so um, that's quite interesting. Um, and we would kind of miss this fact, I think, if we again tried to say that Calabit was Philippine type and, and therefore was somehow not accounting for the fact that the basic word order appears to change depending on the voice construction. How much time do I have left? Um, you can go to so. Okay, all right. So um, again, I want to propose to you a kind of alternative possible way of looking at variation in word order as opposed to just saying this group of languages is verb initial and this group of languages is SVO. Um, and I want to propose that uh, the, the way to do it is to look at kind of variation in the, the orders that we find, the possible orders and the degree of word order flexibility, um, and also to look at the kind of choices that affect which word order we choose. So not just to say this language is SVO, but to say in this context we might use this construction and so on. Um, and I think this is an interesting way of looking at word order um, in Western Austronesian because it allows us to address another proposed historical change, um, which is namely the reanalysis of a kind of topicalization construction to the basic order of grammatical functions. So the idea is you can get SVO as a kind of marked construction in Philippine type languages, but when you get this order, that S has to indicate, well, I guess, the topic by the topicalization um, idea, but what it seems to me is that it, it kind of really represents particularly newsworthy information. So that might be focus, or that might be um, a, a new topic or contrast or some, something like that. So it seems to be that um, in Philippine type languages, this, this construction or this order is restricted to those contexts where the subject really has a particular information structure role, um, whereas in Indonesian type languages, um, SVO is just the basic order of our grammatical functions. Um, and what's kind of interesting, if you sort of look at these types of factors, um, it seems that in languages like Calabit, where the word order is affected by um, 
the voice construction, uh, SVO kind seems to be sort of a topicalization construction in these UV contexts that look a bit more Philippine type, whereas SVO seems to be the kind of basic word order um, in AV contexts where it looks a bit more Indonesian type. Um, so perhaps we can just have a little look at some of the data that supports this, um, and then we'll conclude all of this very heavy data for you. Um, okay, so if you look in 25, um, you can see an example from CDIC, which remember was our kind of what I said, fixed VOS order, meaning to say that you can't find VSO. Um, in CDIC, you can get a kind of SEO construction, which is possibly also to be analyzed as a type of cleft um, in contexts where that S represents particularly newsworthy information. So, for example, in 25B, if we said who drank the wine, then we can get Pawan, this kind of nominal particle, and then drink wine. So that would be a kind of SVO order. Um, but there, Pawan really represents the focus information in the sense that it's the answer to the, the question and therefore the, the kind of newsworthy thing. So this is really, these this types of order is really restricted to that context. Um, in Indonesian type languages, as we saw, already SVO is just the basic word order, and we see that in terms of discourse frequency and various other factors. And actually, in Indonesian, it kind of goes the other way. So when we get verb initial orders, these have a kind of marked pragmatic function. So perhaps they mark a predicate focus or sort of contrastive reading on the predicate or something like that, um, as shown in, in the example 26, which comes from uh, spoken corpus of Jakarta and Indonesian. Um, so that's kind of two ends of the spectrum, if you like. When we look at Calabit, um, we can see that for UV, which remember the basic order in UV was verb initial, um, in UV, if we have a verb initial order, this tends to be contexts where both actor and undergoer are uh, topical, and SVO is reserved for contexts in which the undergoer really has a kind of newsworthy role to play. Um, so an example of that is in 27, where again, um, the undergoer represents the answer to the question, so it's the kind of focus information in that, in that context. Um, and in 28, you see an example of VOS, where if, if you read through it, all you'll see that um, <coughs> both... So if the, the kind of example sentence of VOS is 28D, and it's kind of verb, actor is N, and then undergoer is N, kina. And both of the, the actor, the n, which is he, and the undergoer fruit have been mentioned in the previous discourse. So they're kind of both topical there. Neither of them are particularly newsworthy in the sort of important information in terms of progressing the story. In this case, is, is the action and what he does to the fruit. Um, and in contrast, if we look at AV constructions, um, then SVO is by far the most frequent word order, and it doesn't necessarily seem to correlate with actors that are particularly newsworthy, like we saw in CDIC. Um, and I think you could see this if you looked at the example 29, um, where we have a question, um, how did he get them the fruit down there if there's three baskets? So this is the question, how, how did he get the fruit down? Um, and the answer is, how do I say it? He dropped the fruit to the ground, um, with SVO word order, he dropped fruit. Um, and I think you could say that the actor isn't particularly newsworthy here um, because the answer to the question would be how. So actually the sort of newsworthy information in this context is probably provided by the verb rather than the actor and the undergo, which are both topical as they're given in the kind of context of the question. So that's just one example. But in general, SVO doesn't seem to correlate particularly with um, an actor that's particularly newsworthy, like in CDIC. Um, and actually what we find in the AV construction is it's VOS that seems to have this marked pragmatic function, um, like in Indonesian. Um, so the example that you want to look at here is F, 30F, where it says, eat fruit only they. Um, and the whole discourse is going on about um, it's collected using a pair story and it's talking about um, two boys who've kind of, the, the man has watched the two boys walking past with his fruit and he's thinking, oh, did they, um, did they steal my fruit? No, they're only eating the fruit. So it's kind of a contrast of reading then on the, on the predicate there. 
Um, so I think what you can kind of see from this is that the UV construction in Calabit appears to be much more Philippine type in terms of its, its word order. There, the UV, uh, VOS construction seems to be basic, and SVO is reserved for sort of pragmatically marked constructions where the undergo is particularly newsworthy. Um, whereas in AV, what you seem to find is um, a situation that's much more Indonesian type in the sense that um, SVO is the basic order and it's the verb initial order that's kind of pragmatically marked in this case. Okay, so to summarize then, I think this suggests that. Um, uh, the reanalysis of SVO as the basic word order might actually begin with AV rather than being a kind of across the board thing, um, and that voice may be therefore important in this historical change as well. Um, it's possible that SVO is preferred in AV because this is an order that fits with universal word order tendencies to put A to put the actor first um, and B to keep the verb and the undergoer or the predicate together. Whereas if we had SVO in the undergoer voice that would actually be violating both of these tendencies because it would put the undergoer first and split the predicate. Um, and perhaps the changes are related, in, you know, in the sense that the change from anti-passive to active uh, increases the discourse frequency, um, and that kind of leads to a change um, or reanalysis from the pragmatically marked order to the basic order of grammatical functions. Perhaps it's the other way round, perhaps reanalyzing active verb undergoer as kind of basic word order somehow leads to verb and undergoer being considered a unit, and that therefore triggers the reanalysis of uh, antipassive to active. I don't really know, but in any way, in any case, I think the point is that these kind of changes seem to be related, and looking at both of the phenomena in more detail. Um, kind of reveals the sort of things that, um, you know, the, the interconnections between these different changes that we find, and definitely, I think, reinforces the idea that a two-way classification just doesn't cut it as a way of capturing this sort of variation. Okay, so concluding then, um, the two-way typology of Philippine type, and Indone uh, Philippine type versus Indonesian type um, I hope that I've shown you that it's inadequate as a means of capturing the full extent of variation in Austronesian for two reasons. Firstly, because languages with typical Philippine type and Indonesian type properties are actually subject to quite a significant amount of internal variation. Um, and secondly, because we find a number of languages, particularly in transitional regions in Borneo and Sulawesi, um, that differ in a kind of non-superficial manner from both Philippine type and Indonesian type languages and therefore are not neatly cat categorized in either one of these two classes. So a better approach to categorization would be to look at um, the different parameters of variation and draw from a wide range of languages uh, rather than simply assigning languages to one of these two groups. This would allow us to explore the interrelationships between things like word order, information structure, um, and voice and contribute to a better understanding of the historical changes that have taken place um, and also allow us to address theoretical debates um, like the alignment debate in a more typologically informed manner. Thank you. Randomly. Well, so I mainly looked at languages in Borneo. So most of the languages that seem to have these mixed properties that I identified were in that area. And I think we would probably, if we go back to the map, um, we might expect that to, to be kind of a reflection of the situation as it really is, um, because the kind of more conservative languages are thought to, I mean, Proto-Austronesian is thought to have um, originated in Taiwan, and the more conservative languages are in the Philippines and in Taiwan, and the more innovative languages are in Indonesia. So you might expect to find transitional languages in the areas that are kind of geographically between them. 
Um, but of course, since I only really looked at languages in Borneo, it's, you know, it's completely possible that we would find other languages that have developed. And in fact, it's probably quite likely that we would find other languages that would you know, differ in certain ways from this prototypical Philippine type or prototypical Indonesian type in other parts of the Western Austronesian group. Yeah. If I can just comment, Lauren, I think we don't have the micro level information that would help with that. I mean, I, I published an article showing in Sasai different dialects of the same language have different alignment systems. So I think we really need much more detail about fine grained analysis. I, I actually remember years ago Laurie Reed's getting very angry about people talking about Philippine type. Cause you know, everyone assuming that all the Philippine languages were like Tagalog. And yeah. Say, Absolutely. This is, you know, this is Tagalog hegemony, and we should, you know, deny this. So, as a specialist of Philip of languages, other languages in the Philippines, he was very much aware of the variation between Cebuano, Ilocano, Kapampangan, and, and Tagalog. Yeah. And I mean, taking this sort of um, saying, okay, this two-way typology is no good and what we need to do is this, but I don't have a very good answer of how these might all fit together. I mean, I don't know if this really solves the problem. And as you say, what, what you kind of, the next step really would be to collect much more data on these sorts of aspects of variation from a kind of wider range of languages so that you could really see what kind of possibilities are possible. So in Collabit, for example, Morphosyntactically, it looks more or less symmetrical. Semantically, the UV construction is normally associated with kind of high transitivity, um, and the uh, AV construction is normally associated with low trans or anti passive like characteristics, but can be also an active, I mean, can have active, a bit like the Moronene data that we saw. Um, and then on the discourse level, we saw that it kind of looked symmetrical with AV. So that, you know, depending on which level you look at with this type of approach, you get a slightly different answer as to which one is more basic. So you might expect that if you looked at a wider range of languages, you could find you know, different types of asymmetries on different levels, depending on where they fit in this kind of change. I, I think a similar story could be told about Banta, where people always talked about symmetrical and asymmetrical, and it, you know, Lutz's work shows that it's actually much more Phil, do you have a valid solid genetic mapping for, for these areas? I if so, what kind of a match do you get between genetic affiliation and some of the phenomena you've talked about? Uh, I think the answer is no, that there isn't a no, very no, good... <laughs> um, yeah, I think that in terms of subgrouping, people have kind of worked out that all of these languages in sort of the darker orange are Western Malayo Polynesian, but kind of are not quite sure what the subgroups, you know, people disagree on what the subgroups would be beyond that. Because there's so much variation. And because a lot of the languages just haven't been described in much detail. Right, okay. yeah. um, I think probably that, I mean, I think people think that there would be a s genetic subgroup that would include quite a lot of the languages in the Philippines, and they might tend to be more sort of prototypically discourse semantic ergative and I think a lot of the Indonesian type languages probably belong to a different subgroup um, but as for the languages in Borneo that's okay. no one really knows. Peter? Um, these transitional properties are these mainly from North Borneo languages and um, other ones like Barang, Kaya, and Kaya as well. Um, also seeing as well down there? Um, I don't know. I think people think that those languages are more kind of similar to Indonesian type, but I think like um, Saban, they don't really have all of these, so they, they don't seem to have passives and applicatives like we find in Indonesian type languages. They just don't have the multi-voice system. And I think voice in, I'm not sure about Bidayu, um, but in some of the languages like Kenya and Kayan, that's something quite different altogether. question for you. Yes. Um, another difference you didn't talk about between the so-called two-way typology is that in Philippine languages the morphology actually messes up aspect and voice. I mean this is usually passed over and 
people don't talk about the fact that you know in perfective you get certain patterns and the perfective you get different patterns. Yeah. That's not there in Indonesian yeah. languages. Yeah. What's the story? Why? Is it connected to anything you say here? Because Hopper and Thompson talk about you know as, um, aspect as being relevant for transitivity. Yeah. So I, I don't know. You haven't, yeah, I think you haven't it built that into your story so far. Yeah, no, it, pro it almost certainly is relevant. Exactly how, um, I don't know. Um, I know that, for example, with Tagalog, some people analyse this um, in infix, which I stupidly didn't actually lay out for you in the morphological gloss. But anyway, the undergo of voice in Tagalog is, some people think that this is marked through an in infix into the root. So we took the root billy and we made it binili. Um, so, so some people treat that as being a combination of undergo a voice plus perfective <coughs> aspect um, and other people argue that actually that is just the perfective aspect marker and the undergo a voice is kind of unmarked um, morphologically um, and the kind of main argument or one of the arguments for that is if you look at the other um, voices apart from active voice so in 3C, G and the second B that should be E then all of them have an in infix in them. So kind of maybe you would get a slightly, I don't know, a simpler analysis if you would treat just the in as marking perfective aspect and then undergo a voice would just be unmarked. Um, so I think some people, I think Kataguri, in fact, analyzed Tagalog as having kind of a split ergative system because he said that the undergo of voice is unmarked in the perfective context, um, whereas the active voice seems to be unmarked if you look at um, irrealis or whatever the opposite of perfective would be. Um, these transitional languages you were talking about, like Calabit and so on, they don't mark perfective and imperfective in the voice? Um, Calabit does. does. So Calabit has um, something that c probably comes from the in infix but has a whole load of different allomorphs, so it's sometimes difficult to work out um, how it relates to in. But anyway, this seems to com seems to mark both undergo a voice and perfective aspect um, and you get a separate form that will mark undergo a voice and irrealis um, but that's not used very productively anymore um, I, don't, I don't know if it's possible that something that was just an aspect marker over time becomes analyzed as a voice marker and then loses its aspectual function and But the nasal voice prefix that marks the active voice in Calabit, so it's unclear to me whether it has some. I think it, I think it probably doesn't have this. Basically, it looks like in Calabit the active voice construction is starting to look a lot like what we find in Indonesian type languages in all sorts of properties, and the undergo of voice kind of maintains some of this. What we know from the Philippines. Yeah, another criterion in the Hopper and Thompson model was the agency. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering to what extent can uh, uh, mechanical objects and natural forces uh, uh, fill the causal slot, like you know, the wind opened the door, the bomb shook the ground, that kind of thing. What? Uh, I don't know in Calabit, that's a good question. Because okay. um, language is different, markedly, in, in what, what objects they allow to fill that slot, yeah. the causal slot. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Okay. No. I have to look. Right. Yeah. Well, I think Phil's right. That might mm. be another parameter that, yeah. and along with the aspectual one, might be other parameters to add to the, the mix of what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. So can, I, <coughs> can I ask you about the, the, the typology of the voice system a bit more? Mm -hmm. um, because I'm curious. So, so the reason I'm asking is because I discussed it before. Because inversion construction and one to the very similar. So you have inversion construction right. of, of the direct object, like mm. you have inversion construction of instruments and properties. But benefactive is not really. So I'm sort of curious that the benefactive here seems to be, you know, sort of a, you know, a member of, of an, a, you know, a member of the set which is not particularly marked on what you say. So, so I'm, I'm curious whether there is, you know, whether there is a distinction between these different voice systems in terms of the predicates they combine with in terms of the, the, you know, the information structure they can do, like 
like the, you know, and like later on in your talk, essentially, but I think that's a question of the language rather than the voice system. You you focus on the active voice and the undergoer voice. Yeah. But the other three voices sort of don't play. Yeah. Role. But is that is that because the languages don't have them, or is that because they don't play part in these wider, you know, wider or maybe because changes? I just didn't look at them? Um, I, so in general, I think that these other constructions are much less frequent than the first two. Um, so I don't can't say really much apart from about Calabit, um, but Calabit has three voices. It has the actor, the undergo, and then an instrumental voice. Mm. And the instrumental voice occurs very infrequently in sort of naturalistic texts. And usually it occurs in, um, because one of the reasons you might want to alternate between which argument is mapped to subject is because you can only form a relative clause on subjects and there are a whole load of properties that only apply to subjects in these languages. Um, so usually the instrument, instrumental voice is used when you want to make a relative, you know, in a relative clause on an instrument. That tends to be when it, so it's quite a marked construction anyway. Um, and I think within the relative clause, because it's a subordinate clause, there are, you know, certain constraints on the word order possibilities and things like that. So, I mean, I didn't really look at them in terms of word order and other things like that could be that you might find something interesting if you did. Remind me the question. I feel like I, I didn't know, ask, no, ask to answer it. I mean, mm -hmm. partly I'm, I was curious whether, you know, I, I would be curious whether the benefactive is slightly the odd one out. And that's bec just because of my background, because the other four, you know, are quite frequent and, you know, the, the properties are quite similar. I guess, you know, I guess in text they're less frequent, but cross linguistically, of course, one they are frequent, but, but the benefactive is, you know, we have Oh, right, you mean in examples. terms of these sort of inversions, um, yeah. And just whether, you know, either within a particular language or, or comparatively, whether they, they come up slightly differently. Yeah, uh, um, could be. I don't, so Calabit doesn't have a benefactive mm -hmm. voice, so, um, yeah, I, no, I don't know. Um, yeah, they do... Um, I mean, so they seem to be kind of ditransitive. I mean, I was calling these equally, symmetrically equal, and what I probably really meant by that was that the actor voice and the undergo voice kind of looked symmetrical. Um, these other voices appear to, they appear a little bit like ditransitive constructions um, in that you seem to have then three arguments that are marked as with these core cases or however it works in the particular language. Um, and what's interesting, at least for Calabit, um, is that you don't really find ditransitive constructions, you know, in other cases. So if you used the, um, oh, what's a good example of this? Um, you would have to say, I gave something to someone. You couldn't be able to say, I, you wouldn't be able to say, I gave yes. someone something yes. with yeah. three kind of core <coughs> arguments. The only case when you get that is with the, these kind of, the instrumental voice construction. Yes. And there, there are applicatives? Is there an applicative method? <laughs> well, so some people treat these, if you kind of adopt an, a like structurally ergative analysis of these languages, which many people do, then they treat um, locative voice, instrumental voice, and benefactive voice as being kind of applicatives. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that there are applicatives that only apply in the undergoer voice. They can't be used in active voice constructions, mm -hmm. whereas the applicatives that we find in Indonesian and that kind of look a lot more like applicatives in Bantu, for example, mm -hmm. you can get them in both mm -hmm. with active voice and undergoer voice. Mm -hmm. um, so they're a kind of little bit applicative-y, but at least how I analyse them, they, they map this kind of instrument or locative or whatever to subject rather than to a direct object, which is, I guess, what you would yes. think of as an applicative. Mm -hmm. So they're sort of half applicative, maybe. Interesting, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think we should uh, thank Charlotte for deconstructing two ways. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you.